Welcome to Celtic State of Mind, I'm Paul John Dykes and today I'm delighted again to be joined by Paul Lamb. Welcome back to the show Paul. Hi Paul, thanks for having us on again. Absolutely, it is now a regular feature podcast where we look through Celtic match worn jerseys, we get the story behind the kits and we talk about our own memories of Celtic wearing those jerseys as well as our opinions, our, our fashionista opinions Paul on whether or not they were classics or they were flops. I think we mentioned last week about the zigzag effort. It's turned into an iconic jersey and what did I call it? An abomination. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think a few people picked up on that. Uh-huh. <laughs> they did. They did. But I mean, it's only one man's opinion, Paul. And yep. uh, you've, you've selected for us again four match-worn jerseys. We're going to do this chronologically way back in 1980. There was a testimonial match for Danny McGrain. Paul, tell us the story of the jersey. The jersey I've got is uh, a goalkeeper jersey from the game worn by Packy Bonner. And in and of itself, a goalkeeper jersey from that era is quite rare to have because by numbers, there's, just, there's fewer of them around than the, the hoops. It's just a couple of unique features that it had. And a number of players and staff had had testimonials before Danny, but this was a, the first game where embroidered match detail featured round the badge. Right. Before that, it was just plain shirts that were used. And also, for some unknown reason to me anyway, as an experiment, they decided to put the players' names on the back of the shirts without numbers. Th- that style of writing, Paul, uh, it reminds me of the kind of thing you would get on a, a cap at Blackpool. It was like the velvety yeah. font, and it was done in black. So, you, I mean, the players' jerseys on the green and white hoops, you couldn't really see the names too well, could you? No, it did, didn't tend to stand out as much as you would think it would. But on the, the yellow goalkeeper shirt, it stands out as very prominent. There's a few points you've made there, Paul, that I'll pick up on. The first one you said there was uh, goalkeeper jerseys is being scarce now as many will know and as we'll probably keep referring back to I'm putting the final touches on the Celtic jersey match worn book which goes delving into the history of Celtic match worn jerseys throughout their, their history and one of the most difficult parts of that book was trying to source goalkeeper jerseys they were few and far between Paul and I mean when you think about it the guy that wore this particular jersey that we're talking about Pat Bonner he played for such a long period of time when the jersey started being incorporated with badges, uh, merchandise logos, eventually sponsors. Previous to that, it was just like normal jerseys. For example, the European Cup final, Ronnie Simpson was wearing the exact same jersey as Celtic wore as an away jersey during that season. It was just the whole green jersey. but yeah, obviously a, a plain green shirt, yeah. Yeah, with the number one. And uh, I did read an interview some time ago with Ronnie where he said he was allowed to keep the big match jerseys, and he did. But there was nothing really specific about any of these jerseys that the likes of Ronnie Simpson or John Fallon would have worn. They were just really, in essence, jerseys, round neck shirts. Yeah. Previous to that, they were proper woolly, heavy jerseys. And for some strange reason, it has been very difficult. I think what it is, for example, if Pat Bonner had his own match-worn collection, Paul, and he's kept it, then he would be the source. But if one of these collections has been sold privately, it, it can quite easily disappear into someone's private collection and then it's very difficult to source, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Uh-huh. Now, the one you mentioned there, looking back on it, it really is quite similar to some of the early away jerseys that Celtic had because it's all yellow. As you say, you've got the uh, embroidery around the crest and I must say, we have had some feedback about the, the first episode of the podcast. I got one text saying that it was like watching snooker on a black and white telly. But by the end of it, that same person said it was a, a very enjoyable podcast. But, you know, you've, you've got to use your own creativity. And, and we do put the images up on Twitter as to which jerseys we are speaking about. So please check the Twitter and we'll be doing links to your website as well for each specific yep. jersey. Now, there was something also very unusual about this particular jersey. Now, Pat Bonner played in this game and by all accounts had a, a fantastic game. But there's something about that jersey that he wouldn't have been too happy about. Yeah, it was the name on the back of it being misspelled. It was misspelled. I remember you sending me a picture of this for the first time. So it's spelled Bonner rather than Bonner. So it's N-N-A-R rather than Pat yeah. Bonner's name being N-N-E-R. And the match itself finished 0-0. Pat Bonner played extremely well. Lou McCarry captained the Manchester United side that Danny McGrain Celtic played. And it was played out in front of, I think, 45,000 fans. So... All in all, a successful night. Pat Bonner at that time, 1980, 
really establishing himself as the Celtic number one. And there's a few theories around this. I spoke to young Neely Mockin, and obviously his father was a kit man at this time. And first and foremost, I asked Neely, would his dad have been responsible for... For example, you know, the embroidery around the badges, Paul. Yeah. Cup final, there would have been a local supplier. He would have sent the jerseys up, got all the embroidery done. So that was that was fair enough. There was then the question about the names. And again, young Neely is quite sure that that would have been a job that his dad would have taken ownership of. So that opens the, the debate up regarding Pat Bonner's name being spelt incorrectly. There's two theories behind it, Paul. Firstly, Neely Mockin played with John Bonner, who was also a goalkeeper and who played yep. in the Coronation Cup final, famously playing exceptionally well in the final. And his name was spelled double N A R. So it could well just be a wee slip. Neely Mockin's familiar with his ex teammate's name, both goalies, easy mistake to make. All right? Or yep. it could be classic Neely Mockin taking the piss out of Pat Bonner. And to be honest with you, Having heard many, many stories about Neely's character, I'm going to opt for the second option. I think it's a wind-up on Neely Mockin's part. What, what do you think? It certainly makes for a better story anyway, yeah. And that was uh, a very rare, uh, one-of-a-kind jersey that you've got in your collection. How did you come about uh, sourcing that one, Paul? It was actually, believe it or not, this shirt came from a collector in Australia right. who had it and had started to sell off his collection. He'd been collecting, he had a huge collection for a number of years and had lost favour with the, the hobby so I was deciding to sell and I was just luckily in the right place at the right time It's again, managed to get it It was a great find Paul and I, I was going to ask you during the isolation and during these uncertain times what is the landscape of match-worn jersey selling looking like at the moment is that something that's increased are people selling off just to to try and give themselves some security at this moment in time? Well, from a, a personal perspective, I haven't noticed anything of a, an upturn. There maybe is out there. I don't know. It just depends on people's personal circumstance. I've had periods before, sometimes post-Christmas, you get a, an influx when people have maybe spent a bit too much and need to have some ready cash, you know, and they tend to start selling things then. So far, I haven't noticed right. anything in the, the lockdown period, but as time goes on, you never know. You never know, especially when you look at some of these big collectors uh, down south as well who have got tens of thousands of jerseys. It's quite incredible. Yeah. And yeah. Um, it goes without saying, jersey number one this uh, week was worn by the one and only Paddy Bonner. Before I move on to the next jersey, Paul, how is your goalkeeper jerseys collection? Is this the only one you've got? Have you got a few in there? I've got a, a few, not many. I would probably say maybe about half a dozen. Mm-hmm. Again, just in general, that there's few and far between to come by. Uh, a couple of big names. I've got a, one one of big Rob Douglas's and a, an early Fraser Foster one. So quite fortunate to have a, a couple of good ones rather than just generic shirts. And both of those, Douglas and Foster, are massive, aren't they? They're huge big jerseys. Huh? Yeah. Moving on to your next selection this week, Paul, we're moving into the realms of the Martin O'Neill era. As soon as you see the jersey we're going to speak about, images of that side that Martin assembled start springing into your mind. Talk to us about the next Celtic jersey we're going to discuss. The next one is a home shot from the, the 2001 to 2003 era. Mm-hmm. And uh, the specific one is from a friendly match that was played at Celtic Park between Celtic and Farnob as a benefit match for the Lisbon Lions. It was. I mean, that, that particular game, it's quite interesting in that, obviously, Feyenoord now are celebrating their 50th anniversary this year, Paul, of defeating us. I mean, Milan for them was our Lisbon and they are organising a number of different events to celebrate that. But Feyenoord came through to Celtic Park and defeated us 3-2 in what was billed as a Lisbon Lions testimonial. So I'm guessing that money would have been split between the surviving Lions and, and their families. Yeah, that's as far as I know, yeah. I'm looking at the game. Unfortunately, there was only an attendance of just over 22,000 for this particular match and Van Hoydonk scored for Feyenoord against Celtic whose goal scorers were John Hartson and Momo Silla. It's a part of history that you've got and um, when you look at the the actual jersey itself as I said it's very much a Martin O'Neill jersey. You look at when O'Neill came in to the manager's job he was replacing an interim manager in Kenny Dalglish and although Kenny had won a trophy. The season had been hugely, hugely disappointing, uh, starting off with Barnes and then Dalglish coming in. Martin O'Neill shelled out a lot of money on the likes of Chris Sutton, Juice Valharan. He later brought in Alan Thompson, Agat, Rab Douglas, who you've already mentioned, Neil Lennon, and Ramon Vega, who was named in the Axom Cult Celtic 11, much to my 
disillusionment, but there you are. With, with regards to O'Neill, I mean, when he came in, what's your memories of the O'Neill factor when he took over the interviews that he gave, the almost instant impact of O'Neill and his signings? Well, I think it was just instant impact was the, the air of confidence he had about him, the way he spoke, and most fans seemed assured that he was going to do as good a job as possible, you know, and then when he started to sign players, when you saw the calibre that he was bringing in, we're hoping that good times were coming, and as history shows, he, he delivered. I was quite puzzled with this jersey when I was doing my research on it, Paul, because as far as I could see, Celtic wore this particular jersey. Now, this is the one that was split down the sides, which was quite controversial at the time, wasn't it? It had the two yeah, panels. The infamous down. broken hoops, the as broken people hoops. referred to. Yeah, the broken hoops. And that's uh, sacrilegious for anybody to, to do that. So when Umbro done that, there was I, I do remember there was a bit of a backlash at that time. Now, that jersey was worn in January 2001, right? And it was worn in a, a friendly match against Tampa Bay Mutiny. The interesting thing is, the match-worn jersey that you've got is two years later. So the first time, as far as my records are concerned, that this jersey was worn was against uh, Tampa Bay Mutiny in 2001. Interestingly enough, we reverted back to the previous jersey before starting to wear this more regularly, which was worn in April 2001. Is that something that, during your research, that you noticed that as well, Paul? We jumped back and forward between two jerseys during that season. Yeah, I know it's, there's obviously this particular style of shirt was introduced for the, the start of the 2001 season, but it, it was actually worn in the last six or seven games of the 2000-2001 season, mm-hmm. the treble winning year, and it was worn in a, a few big games. Well, it is quite unusual for a shirt to be introduced before the end of, of a season. It, is, it really is unusual, and it kind of threw me uh, when I was doing my research as well, and it's unlikely that any manufacturer deal would allow that to happen again now. It's very much much, you know, the things are launched in the summer and, and we run with the three kits from there. But in, in respect of that then, the, the actual match-worn jersey you've got, Paul, were you able to identify who wore it against Feyenoord? Something I've, I've struggled with. The shirt itself, I, I actually got this from a collector in Thailand. When he gave me the information on it, he told me it was worn by Sean Maloney in the game. But in straight away, he ended in those, the squad numbers. It's a number 23 shirt, right. whereas... Sean Maloney wore number 29 at the time. I've struggled to find detailed team list for the game. To pin an exact player on it is, hasn't been easy. The search goes on, Paul, as it does yeah. with so many collectors. I mean, what I liked about this particular jersey, again, the match embroidery right in the centre, and it was in the, the gold embroidery on the, the green hoop. So yeah. it looked it looked pretty classy. And then you had the very specific Lisbon Lions crest embroidered on the, the sleeve of the jersey as well, which really just added to the unique quality of that match-worn jersey. It looks stunning, doesn't it? Yeah, the, the, the quality of the, the work on it is super. Did you see the, the gold thread for the match detail across the chest? And the, the fact that the, the Lisbon Lions crest on the sleeve it isn't a patch that's stitched onto the, the shirt. It's fully embroidered mm-hmm. into the sleeve. And the, the quality of it is just second to none. It really adds to it. And again, I think looking back on it now, it's got all the hallmarks of a classic Celtic jersey. It's got thin hoops. Just having a look at it here, you know, when we go back to the 90s, some of the lesser popular jerseys had less hoops. You know, the, the big umbro one in 94 yeah. with the, I think it was four hoops. This one's got six hoops, six green hoops. The NTL, again, it's not on a big patch, so it's not stuck on the front of the jersey. It's, you know, you can see the both hoops behind it, which I think is important, yeah. you know, looking at the jersey. It's a V, it's a V-neck, Paul, with, with a very small V insert underneath, which was, yeah. you know, again, looking back on it, it's quite a classy looking design, and probably even with uh, the broken hoops down the sides, if you ignore that, it's one of the best home jerseys of, of modern times, in my opinion. Yes, yeah, it well, it's iconic, I would say, you know, as you mentioned earlier, with the, when it was first introduced with the, the broken hoops, there was a, a huge backlash from fans, but everyone looking back on it now is instantly just thinks of the run to Seville, even though they, they didn't play in that shirt in the final, but every game up to it was played wearing this style of shirt. I mean, even if you think about, talking about breaking the hoops up, Paul, there's been a few examples fairly recently that, you know, if, for example, if you don't have hoops on the sleeves it doesn't look for me like Celtic hoops and you know the new balance jersey that almost looked as though it had missed out the top green hoop at the very very top so you know if players were being photographed you know from the, the head up often it just looked like yeah. a white top like a, like a white polo shirt that we're wearing 
yeah. didn't scream out Celtic to me. And then another one which we haven't covered yet, and I'm sure we will in the future, was the, the one where the hoops had individual white hoops through them as well. So every hoop looked like seven small hoops. And when I look, yeah. when I look back on that now, Paul, I just I don't think it's uh, it's aged very well. It's one of these for me as someone who's kind of studied the jersey and you as a, as a Celtic collector a jersey collector I would say that you know one of the, the golden rules is you just don't break up the hoops and you don't make them too thick there's got to be you know six hoops green hoops and make them plain don't mess about with the hoops everything round about them is, is your kind of template isn't it? Yeah I think over the years a few people have tried to get creative with it one of the ones we featured last week the, the 95 up with the, the Celtic detail and the green hoop mm-hmm. and the season before where the, the Umbro logo was shadowed into it as well yeah. on the, the thicker hoops sometimes you get away with it other times it just spoils it Absolutely I mean, I mean we are going to speak about another home jersey as jersey number four in this podcast and yeah. to be honest with you all the hallmarks of classic Celtic home jerseys Almost all the hallmarks are in that one, so we'll come back round to that. But yeah. before we do that, also under Martin O'Neill, we went to Hamden in May 2004 to play against Dunfermline in the Scottish Cup final, Paul. And what an incredible occasion it was because, you know, at half time we were one nothing down. Were you at that game yourself, Paul? Yeah, I was. Uh-huh. All these years later, Paul, right? So that's 2004, so 16 years later. Anybody you speak about this game to in the Dunfermline area, they go on about the fact that Bobo Baldi handled the ball before we broke away and Larson scored the equaliser, right? And this is the big thing. I mean, I think the problem actually was the fact that they played a young guy called Aaron Labonte, a Dunfermline defender, who was given the onerous task of Mark and Henrik Larson that day and if you watch back on the footage Larson skinned him you know he just <laughs> and that was a bigger issue for them filming I think than the fact that Big Bobo should have been penalised for allegedly handling the ball yeah. but again I've spoken to quite a few of the Dunferman players about it about that supposed handball and they're, they're very much more of the view that they were beaten by a fantastic Celtic team but a very, very special player in Henrik Larson who turned that game around, you know. So every time I think of the game, I think about Larson racing away in this kit that you're now going to speak to us about. Describe the jersey uh, to us, Paul, and your thoughts on the design. This was a, the 2003-2004 Away shirt, the green and silver, as most people would remember it. Yeah. It's a very distinctive shade of green. Unusual for a, a Celtic kit, but from my memory, it was it was an instant like for a lot of fans. The silver flashes through it. You know, when I look at this jersey as well, I think we were coming up to that Scottish Cup final and we were preparing really to bid farewell to Henrik Larson. And coming up to Umbro had started to do, I'll go back onto the old adverts as well that the, the manufacturers used to put out, Paul. Obviously, it's now a big event. You know, the, the launch of the kits is a big event. Celtic's yeah. Christmas advert is a big event. You, I'm not saying you look forward to it, but you know that something good is going to come out content-wise, video-wise. And you've now almost got, like, movie posters of Celtic players with their chest pumped out kind of thing with the new jerseys and that on with the videos that go with it. And it's great. It's brilliant that the club and the manufacturers go to the effort. I think this was the kind of early days of them doing that. The tagline was green equals silverware. That was the Umbro tagline. And obviously it, it yeah, did. Yeah, I remember that now you, you mentioned it. Uh-huh. And you used to get the players to pose like they were models. And, uh, you know, actually looking back and it, yep. you've got Neil Lennon, you know, with the, with the look on his face as if he's on, on a movie poster. It's actually quite amusing to look back on. But the, the jersey itself, you look at it, you think, I think the problem for me is it, it doesn't look silver. Although it's green and silver, it's it just green and grey. When you look at it, it's green and yeah. grey. I think the way it comes across in photographs and things like that, it does have a, a grey colouring to it. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Now, obviously, you can get the silver. You can get the silver look. There's material and, and there's print out there that can get that. And this this particular jersey, one thing again, because maybe I'm a traditionalist, Paul, this is when we started doing the badges and it was just two-tone rather than the full colour embroidery. Yeah. And I think the jersey... Uh, one of the, the colours from the, the colour scheme of, of the shirt that the badge was picked out in. What's your thoughts on that? Because I'm not a big fan of that. I just think it makes the jersey look like a training top. Yeah, it was, I would agree with that, yeah. I, was, I would say the, the two-tone badge, as you say, would be more a prominent feature on training wear and the traditional crest would appear on shirts. Mm-hmm. I would say that looks definitely looks better if it was a traditional badge. I think so. And I mean, 
when you look at the the embroidery, that's changed entirely as well. I'm no aficionado when it comes to embroidery, but it's almost like a crest which is embroidered onto the jersey, whereas in the past, you know, every thread was embroidered on right onto the material. But I do I do quite like the jersey though. Looking at it. Paul, I do. I think it was a. It was a fairly classy looking design. I like the the way that they used the carlin and changed the colours of the, the sponsor to match with the colour scheme of the jersey. That's always a big yeah. bug. Bear in mind if if the sponsor almost ruins the jersey, it looks like it's just stuck on as an afterthought. But it was integral to the design. Umbro were going through their stage where it was a double diamond with no umbro underneath. Uh, it looks kind of 90s to me when I look at that. I much prefer the, the lettering underneath. And obviously you've got the, the Scottish Cup patch on the, the sleeve. And whose jersey was this? Who wore this in the Cup final? I would say I'm not 100% certain this was worn in the game. As anybody who knows, the players would probably have possibly two, maybe even three shirts made for a game such as this for the, in case of any damage or anything like that. But the example I've got was a certain number seven who played that day and Henrik Larson. You know, the question is for someone like me is how on earth would you ever be able to identify whether or not that was one of the jerseys that was there just in case there was a, a tear or, or blood or whatever and he had to swap his shirt or if it was indeed the one that Henrik wore. Is there any way of trying to identify that? The classic technique for identifying shirts for collectors is photo matching from the game. Mm-hmm. Looking for any placement of patches, name sets, etc. On home shirts of that period, it was a lot easier because of the hoops on the shirt, and it was easier to see where a letter or a number appears on the back of the shirt. Whereas this one, because it's just a plain colour, it's virtually impossible to tell the placement if it was or not. I would tend to think it wouldn't be. I, I, I believe myself this is a a spare shirt of his I don't think it would have been the one he wore in the game but to even have a spare shirt from a game like that obviously it was his last competitive game for the club it's still something pretty special Absolutely When I look at that there may well be an occasion Paul where I like these features where they delve into players collections you know and they look at as well as their medals they look at their jerseys and I think Henrik Larson's a type of person who has never felt the need, clearly, to, to offload any of his, his prized possessions. You would have thought that the person who has the match-worn jersey would be Henrik himself. And I just think maybe it'll be us. Maybe we'll do the feature when we start taking the, the camera out and about and visiting players and, and having a look at what they've got. It would be great to see if, if Henrik's got it. And if so, even if he does have it, it means it's you know confirmation for you that, that you had the spare from that particular day. But I think... Henrik's the kind of guy who will probably have piles and piles of his memorabilia stashed away in Sweden somewhere. Yeah, it's highly likely. It's, it's always good if you get the opportunity to speak to a former player. If they do still have many shirts from the collection mm-hmm. of their playing days, especially when you see things come up for sale, it's always it's a good source of knowing if it's genuine or not. You know, if you know the player himself still has it. Or. Without a doubt. And a special jersey in any case, regardless of whether or not that was worn on the day, Paul. Now, the fourth jersey we're going to look at today is, for me, one of the best Celtic home jerseys of modern times. Talk us through the jersey and the match that you most associate this jersey with. Uh, well, next one we have is the, the home shirt from the 2012-2013 125th anniversary season. Mm-hmm. The classic thin green and white hoops with uh, the Celtic badge on it with the Celtic design printed round about it and uh, unusual to have a small team sponsor logo just below the badge rather than featuring across the middle of the shop where they normally do. Mm-hmm. There's a few uh, things There's a few things about this, this kit. I think the 125th anniversary jerseys all three of them were pretty special, Paul, weren't they? And this was no different for a home kit. Oh, you definitely. Most people I speak to whenever you ask them about kits over the last 20 years or so, the 125th anniversary season is the one that always comes out on top. The, the three kits were classic designs, just absolutely loved by everyone. And they still remain favourites to people to try and source, especially the, the away shops, which are quite rare. Yeah. And regularly get asked by people if they can get hold of one. Well, you know... You mentioned the sponsor there, and I think that worked very, very well, particularly on the white jersey that we had with the the 125th anniversary crest. And then just underneath it was almost like the invisible sponsor because it was white on white. The the one on the home jersey, underneath the crest, the tenants had the, the black border around it, so it stood out that little bit more. 
What really annoyed me about the tenant sponsor throughout our time with them, Paul, was it never sat on a hoop. It always broke up two hoops. Is that the type of thing that only likes me get annoyed by? It should have been within one hoop rather than it was like in the middle of a, a white and a green hoop. Yeah, well, I think it's, I suppose it comes down to possibly an OCD thing in your part. Uh, <laughs> and it does it does get a lot of people over the years in the early 80s. And well, when sponsors first started appearing on, shirt, on the, the player shirts, they were always larger than would appear on the replica shirts that you would buy in the shop yeah. to make it stand out more and photographs on TV. And when you see it, for also the sponsor's benefit, in certain cases, it would fit perfectly on a single hoop depending on the, the style of shirt. So I think it was just a unfortunate combination of the, the style of shirt and the, the size of logo used at the times where it would, it would break over. Absolutely. Now, at the time that Nike released his jersey, they claimed that there was nine green hoops and that was to commemorate nine in a row uh, in, the, in the club's 125th year. And the nine hoops... Looks good, Paul. I mean, they're thin hoops, but it, it really does look good. The round neck, white neck, kind of, you know, nods back to Lisbon. And then you've got the, the Celtic band around the, the crest to commemorate the 125th year. This jersey will always be remembered, of course, for the, the victory against Barcelona when Tony Watt scored that goal. And interestingly enough, two little things about this this entire kit that uh, spring to my mind is there was a, a tenant's logo on the shorts, you know, the, the red T appeared on the shorts. So sponsorship started moving towards the, the shorts and also we wore black socks initially when it was launched. We, we wore black socks with this jersey and that was... For, for the first time since the 1930s that Celtic wore wore black socks and very quickly we stopped wearing them. I don't know if, you, again, you noticed that we wore them for a couple of the games and then we just reverted back to the white socks after that. Yeah, I remember that. Clearly, I remember the, the promotional photographs when this kit was launched with the, the black socks and the, the season team photograph from that season mm-hmm. has them wearing the black socks in it and for me, it never looked right and I know a lot of people were the, the same so I don't know whether... They listen to feedback or they just, they could see it themselves and decide to change to the white socks. Yeah. Now, the jersey in question that, that you're presenting from your collection today, Paul, has the, the league patch on, on the sleeve. Are you able to identify the game this was played in and, and who wore the jersey? Yeah, uh, this one's 100% nailed on and it's a Chris Collins number 15 shirt and it was worn in a, a rather special game at Parkhead against Aberdeen and a, a 4-3 win. If you remember Samara scoring a, an overhead kick in stoppage time to win the game. Absolutely, yeah. This particular was Chris Collins. It was... This was a match where he scored at the time the fastest ever SPFL goal or SPL goal in 12 seconds from kickoff. Mm-hmm. That was at a time, Paul, where Commons really was one of our star star men. You know, he always for me looked like he was carrying a wee bit of weight, Paul. He always looked as though he was car- he was a bit heavy. And regardless of that, his goal scoring record was incredible for the seasons that he played. It just really is unfortunate that his final season ended up with him not playing many games. But I thought for a period, Commons was Celtic's top man. I mean, the goals he scored was, were quite incredible. And it's great that you've managed to source one of Commons. And actually, when I think of Commons, I probably think I'm in this jersey as well, to be honest. You know, when I think back to Chris Commons at Celtic, I think back to him wearing this iconic looking hooped jersey. One final question for you on the, the second instalment of the Celtic Match Worn podcast, uh, which has been called A Strip Down Memory Lane by our designer who's given us a wee graphic and I think we'll stick with that because it's pretty good. Yeah, I like that. Uh-huh. Is We've spoken about a couple of Celtic home jerseys today. Uh, one which bore all the, the hallmarks of a classic with nine hoops, a, a round neck, a very small sponsor. The other one had the broken hoops but actually looking back on it, it's a very smart jersey. You know, what would you like Adidas to do with the hoops this season? I think Adidas are famous for some classic strips over the years, some of the most iconic football shirts have been Adidas and for them to tackle the hoops now is quite a feat for them. I know a lot of people would like to see the traditional three stripes down the sleeve yeah. from Adidas. Whether that will work or not would be great to see. But as a sport, it's just a classic seven or nine hoops across the shirt. And particularly, I particularly prefer a round collar or possibly V, mm-hmm. but not having I mean, the current home shirt with the, 
the collar attached to it I'm not a big fan of so I think going to those traditional styles would be the way for me I think so as well particularly when it's going to be a commemorative jersey in itself to celebrate nine league titles in a row Paul you would hope they would go back to the kind of historical look of Celtic during those times now obviously I wouldn't expect us to go for the floppy collar that's something that you don't really see very often these days but maybe the round neck would, would look great I'd love to see a return to the big green numbers on the shorts as well even just for one season you know to yeah, yeah that would nine. look good that <laughs> would look amazing before we go Paul please remind all our listeners where to find your collection of jerseys online uh, you can check out all the, the shirts from my collection on www myceltic.co.uk and I will add links to the four jerseys we've mentioned today the 125th anniversary home jersey the 2004 Scottish Cup final Henrik Larson's last competitive match uh, we also had the Celtic Feyenoord game back in 2003 and the Danny McGrain testimonial match as worn by Paddy Bonner misspelt with his name on the back Paul it's been an absolute pleasure again to speak to you let's do it again next week Look forward to it. All right, you take care now. Speak to you soon. Feels late. 